All right, cool. So um, I'll just get started. I was supposed to give a slide, a little background on myself, uh, Senior Dir Director of Data Science and Engineering at Malwarebytes. Um, and um, I guess I'll start with a little bit of background on Malwarebytes before we get into like what we're actually gonna do. So I got a little short video. Oh, no sound. Okay, so that's what we do. We defeat malware. Um, this is our CEO, uh, Marcin. Um, really, the background is is that we're, he believes that everyone has a right to a malware-free existence. Uh, we talk about um, the mission behind everything that we do around 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 data, big data, is really to to, to move forward and create the best disinfection and uh, protection solutions to combat the world's most harmful threats. Okay, so onto the talk. Really, um, we're just talking about big data, and uh, I got hired at Malwarebytes uh, almost a year ago, and we talked about covering four areas, product analytics, customer analytics. We needed to build out a threat data lab, and there's something that was new to me, which is called threat marketing, right, right? which is all around um, um, discovering and, and, and uh, understanding the landscape of malware out there. I think m almost everybody here knows about um, product and customer analytics, so we won't talk about that. Uh, we'll focus almost everything that we talk about today on the, the threat side, because I think that, that's actually what makes sense. The key to uh, detection in the malware or the antivirus world is really that um, there's a huge amount of data that you can collect, right? We actually um, are pretty fortunate that we actually give away our software uh, for free. There's a huge uh, a free user base, hundreds of millions. And so we have a mountain of data, and it's, it's basically impossible for us to know what parts of the data are, or at least before we came, it was impossible for the company to know, the researchers to know, what parts of the data were important and interesting to look at. And so what we did was we figured out that sort of the real-time happenings of the world, the real-time uh, threats that are attacking the, the globe at this moment, it really helps us to focus our research effort in that very uh, minute, hour, and day, right? That, that, that's where we need to spend uh, our researchers' attention. And so there's five, basically five keys to threat detection that I had to learn, which is basically to be first. And so what that meant was, was that speed really did matter. In other landscapes, I'm a traditional data warehouse guy. We had things like KPIs and we'd manage to exceptions. Um, in, this, in this scenario, really speed does matter. And so we started thinking about, wow, should we do kind of a Lambda architecture? This sounds like a Lambda problem, right? We got all excited. Um, but uh, you know, if you take a look, uh, what uh, my, my friend Jay over here, he did a big article on Lambda architecture and why it's garbage and, and, and whatnot. But the key to Lambda architecture, traditional Lambda architecture, is that you're, you're, there's some downfalls to it, right? You're actually implementing your code two times, once in the speed layer and once in the batch layer. And so we looked at that, we said, that's probably not what we want to do. We, we don't want to have everything in the speed layer and also everything in the batch layer. But we do need to have the speed uh, give us some direction, give the researchers some direction on where they can focus their efforts. And so what we developed was kind of a, almost a, what we call a, a internally like a Lambda 2 architecture. And what we did was we created a very thin uh, real-time layer um, we pushed a lot of the processing back into Kafka and Kafka streams. That was a sort of a common processing layer. And then we really built out the batch layer in a traditional way, sort of using big data technologies like Hadoop. And uh, I'll let Manju talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, we do some serving like unification in order to make all of this work. All right. I'm the talking guy, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get out of the way. Um, and I'll let these, these cool gentlemen uh, 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 dig a little deeper. So I'll introduce uh, Manju, uh, Senior Manager of Data Science and Engineering. He'll talk a little bit more about architecture. Yeah. Thank you, Darren. So uh, yeah, my name is Manju. I'm a Senior Manager in, in Data Science and Engineering Group in Malwarebytes. Before joining Malwarebytes uh, eight months ago, I was working in a uh, technology services company called Infosys building uh, data warehousing, business intelligence, big data, and data science solutions for uh, Apple. So, um, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, at Malwarebytes, we have uh, multiple technologies to protect our customers from world's most harmful internet threats. We have anti-malware, we have anti-ransomware, anti-exploit, malicious website protections. We also have products for uh, business business uh, enterprises as well, like breach remediation, endpoint protection, mm -hmm. and you know also other uh, products like adware cleaner. So uh, really, the goal here is to make sure that we provide layers of uh, protection for our customers uh, so that they can navigate through the world of internet without any issues. So uh, if you look at it, you know, when I joined Malwarebytes, you know, one of the interesting use cases that we found that our security research team as well as our malware intelligence teams are grappling with is on how to detect, you know, malware or ma malicious payloads that are being delivered through exploit kits. So if you look at it, we have a uh, anti-exploit technology that uh, protects our customers from this malicious software that are being delivered through exploit kits. What is an exploit kit? Exploit kits are basically, you know, a software which runs on the web servers and that takes advantage of security holes uh, on the client machines. It detects the vulnerabilities. For example, it could be a flash exploit or a vulnerability in flash or Java runtime environment or other cases and then uses those uh, vulnerabilities to deliver malicious payload to the client's machine. So we actually had to look at what kind of threats are coming in uh, through these exploit kits and then provide certain uh, you know, capabilities for our security research and malware intelligence team so that they can identify what's going on and how we can protect our customers from those harmful threats. So what our security uh, uh, research and intelligence team really wants to know is you know, if you look at it, security always wants to understand what's happening in the world out there. Like, what are the most harmful threats that are affecting more people in more places, in more ways, on more days? So if we can quantify that information, then we can actually protect our customers from those harmful threats. So in order to answer that question of how much threats are happening for more people in more places, in more ways, on more days, we have to look at uh, certain parameters. Some of them are real-time parameters and some of them are batch parameters. For example, we need to look at the velocity, so how fast these security threats are uh, happening um, across the world and we are, what are the geographical locations that are being targeted for these type of threats. And also look at you know what are the domains from which those th security threats are coming in. And also look at if, if our product itself is being used by you know uh, criminals to see if you know, if, if they can develop those softwares to bypass our product. So uh, there are such certain things like, you know, criminals will use our product and see if their malware is getting caught or not, and then they release it out in the wild. So other things like, you know, we had to give our users capabilities such as research. So look at all of the historical data sets, have some data labs where they can uh, experiment on the, the rules that they are defining and then create a leaderboard so, so so that they can have trends. For example, what is the most uh, used exploit kit in the last two weeks or in the last one month? Is it the Neutrino exploit kit? Is it the Sundown exploit kit? Is it the Rig exploit kit? So on and so forth. So we had these requirements of both real time as well as batch. So we wanted to look at how we can you know address these needs. So we, uh, we had to develop this infrastructure and solutions that kind of provides both real-time and batch capabilities and a unified view of both real-time and batch so that the research team as well as intelligence team can find out what's happening around the world and then uh, make sure that our products are actually capable of protecting our customers from these threats. So what are the challenges that we had um, you know, in building this solution? So when I got in, basically if you look at it, Malware bytes, you know, don't have access to resources as most big companies do. So we have to be smart in way in which we actually do uh, build our infrastructure and provide, you know, capabilities and cutting edge technologies to our research team. So one of the parameters that we set out for is time to market. So how do we look at, uh, you know, building solutions that can be deployed quickly? So so we looked at this parameter and then we looked at cloud computing. So if uh, the New York Times, you know, famous columnist Tom Friedman says that back in the old days, uh, people used to locate themselves on the banks of Amazon River, and now people are locating themselves on Amazon.com because that's where, 
you know, the capabilities are being provided, cutting edge technologies are happening. So we looked at this and we said, okay, we will locate ourselves in Amazon Web Services. And, you know, there are a host of technologies and Amazon is trying to crack uh, uh, the real world problems in the right way. So we chose Amazon Web Services as our cloud computing platform uh, to deliver this big data infrastructure. The other thing that challenge that we had was, you know, with respect to dealing, dealing with high volumes and also with respect to keeping the cost down. So one of the things that we did is we looked at how this really the new internet based companies, how they are structuring themselves. So we looked at tools and we really the Kafka came out as one of the tools that can be used for streaming ingestion. So Kafka is being used by Netflix, LinkedIn, Twitter. So we looked at that and we said, okay, we will embrace open source technologies to solve our problem. So we, we located ourselves in cloud computing space. We embraced open source technologies. And when we were doing this, we, we said, you know, uh, we have to be extremely careful on where we focus our energy and attention. The reason is there are so many things that's going on. There is so much, the pace of acceleration in digital technologies is happening so quickly that it is very important that we focus our energy and attention in you know solving real world problems. So we thought, why not we take some of the learnings that is happening in the traditional space and then you know use those learnings, those tools as well in order to build our infrastructure. So the workflow orchestration, so we didn't want our engineers to spend most of their time on job failures or how to schedule jobs. So as in one of the keynotes earlier in the morning today, Ted from uh, Ted was actually speaking about from Mapar was speaking about if if we if we make everyone focus on everything, nothing can be done. So we have to make sure that everyone focus on certain problem statements. So we said we will look at this whole underpinning this workflow orchestration through time tested software. So that's where BMC workload automation, you know, came into our minds, and then we tested out, and that kind of you know uh, helped us to make sure that the workflow orchestration, the SLA management in the big data space can be handled by the tools that are actually solving this problem in the IT world. So, so we chose with BMC workload automation as the software. So if you look at our current architecture, so this is how it looks like. So we have you know tons and tons of, uh, of installations that are out there in the wild. Uh, so these products that are installed in the customers is sending us anonymous data collection is happening uh, from customers who chose us to send this data set. So we collect this data set, we uh, send it through you know Amazon load balancing. We also have our custom API to accept this request and then we route it this through Kafka topic. And then from Kafka topic, we actually route it to a speed layer uh, through you know through technologies of Kafka stream and Kafka connect and then uh, using HBase, we actually compute all of our real-time indicators. We also fork this data set into a batch layer, and then in batch layer is where we do transformations and uh, enrichments, and then we make those data set available to users on uh, a Cloudera Impala so that uh, you know it can be accessed for reporting, visualization, and as well as other purposes like uh, research and you know interactive SQL querying. So while we while we do do this, basically what happened was we wanted to embrace all of the things that's happening out there in the big data space, like you know ephemeral clusters. So we partner with a company called Qbol, which kind of helps us to build ephemeral clusters. So it can spin up a cluster and spin down the clusters, so that we can actually have clusters only for the the amount of time that we need, so that we can keep our cost as well as down. So we we have the uh, ephemeral cluster which does our computing depending upon the volume that we have, the nature of data and then the time it takes, it spins up the cluster and spins it down. So Qball helped us to build this ephemeral clusters. And all of this, you know, we underpinned this entire technology using BMC uh, control M uh, batch automation. So what it does is it gives us capability to manage our SLAs as well as, you know, uh, it gives us capability to uh, uh, stuffs like you know, uh, predict whether our SLAs or whether our jobs are going to complete on time or not. So we have used the speed layer and then batch layer, and we have provided unification API. And from then we have actually given capabilities to our 
security research and intelligence teams to dig into the data, look at the real time indicators, look at you know the historical trending, look at leaderboards and then uh, you know make decisions on where to spend their focus on. So we are not stopping there, you know. So we are also also actually looking aggressively on where we can embrace, you know, future. So if you look at what's happening in the, in the big data space, basically, you know, a lot of things that 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 can be managed. We are actually trying to give it to the people who do it best, so that we can actually focus on the real engineering problems. So one of the things that's happened is Amazon has come out with Amazon Athena, which is like. SQL access and it's like a serverless architecture. They manage everything, and we just have to, you know, uh, uh, give our SQL queries, and then everything goes after the S3, and then it computes. So we just pay for compute. So we are trying to aggressively pursue in future architecture as well. Look at you know serverless architecture. Look at how we can use Amazon DynamoDB. Look at how we can use Control M even in the speed layer in order to do uh, data quality checks and then in the batch layer for SLA management. In that way, we can actually, you know, focus on real world problems, whereas, you know, all of the stuffs which have already been solved like workload automation, those can be, you know, used by the champions. Like for example, BMC, it has been in the leader position in Gartner Magic Quadrant in the workflow automation space for quite quite some time. So we we want to actually use uh, capabilities we want to make sure that we associate with the best to become the best so so we are aggressively per pursuing all of the new newest technologies also in our future architecture i would like to now call upon sujai you know who will give you a little bit, bit more deep dive into the engineering aspects of what we are doing using this workload automation in this lambda architecture That slide makes me nervous. Uh, thank you, Manju. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, before I deep dive and get into the weeds of it, I just want to take a minute and ex uh, give a brief about my background and what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I joined Malwebytes data science and engineering team with about 10 years experience in like typical data warehousing, uh, implementing solutions at very large scale from companies like Apple, uh, emphasis and very recently I was at GoPro and lucky to be a part of team which built big data platforms from scratch. So what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, I'm a typical big data engineer and my tasks involves profiling data, ingestion, streaming ingestions, batch ingestions, ETL, transformations, stateful transformations, stateless transformations, aggregations to support typical dashboarding, decision support systems, and support. Uh, support would typically mean performance enhancement, uh, catering to the needs of our research and intelligence lab, etc. So let's take a quick look at what a tech stack looks like. Uh, for our platform, at the center of all of it, we have Hadoop. And as most of you know, uh, any big data platform is not just one technology, a few technologies. It's actually a combination of multiple technologies and multiple tools working in, working in harmony. So if we pause for a minute and take a look at this, uh, it becomes very clear that intermodule communication or wiring between the tools uh, can become extremely complex over time and has to be dealt very early and with caution. If operational efficiency is something you really care about, keeping in mind uh, the pace at which all the open source technologies are evolving, the technology adoption rates, uh, growing complexities, etc., uh, it, it's very obvious that uh, something like workload automation or orchestration cannot be left as an afterthought. So uh, I know what most of you are thinking, like, are we taking workload automation too seriously? Uh, this is exactly what I was thinking about two and a half, three years back, and I learned it the hard way. You hit the ground running, you start delivering on projects, uh, you start adopting new technologies, wiring new tools, and within about a year or two, you would end up with an architecture that would look something like this. It's a total chaos. Uh, I'm sure a few of you have gone through this phase. So how do you like retrofit something into this? How do you even do an impact analysis? 
Uh, for that matter, how do you even document for something like this, if that's the thing you care about? So it was very clear that we needed something very simple, scalable, reliable, and as Manju said, something that is time proven to manage our eventing framework or orchestration layer, call it workload automation. Uh, preferably something that understood big data and uh, the semantics of distributed computing natively. So once we had established that we needed to invest time and effort into building out this like, workload automation, like what next? Uh, build or buy? Do we build some or do we buy some? A simple Google search, like build versus buy, uh, will give you top five, top 10 evaluation parameters, decision metrics, etc. Uh, also, as an engineering team, we really didn't want to spend too much time uh, doing stuff or like reinventing wheels. Uh, as an analogy, like in the modern times, if you're a fast growing aggressive company like Malware Bytes, who do you think would invest time in building their own email service or instant messaging? or version control repository. I don't think anyone would do that. So when you think about all this, uh, it made our decision process very easier. We set out to buy. Some brainstorming sessions, some architectural discussions gave us more clarity on what we actually needed out of the tool and what was you know, nice to have, need to have, and nice to have features. On a lighter note, if you look at this slide, I've tried to make both the faces smiling because engineers love building things and with proper justification, management don't have any problem you know, throwing out some cash and buying tools. OK, uh, now that we decided we set out to buy a product for this, like who's the best? That's the next big question. Uh, we did some market research, online research. We networked with a lot of folks in the community. And from our past learnings, we narrowed down a focus on a few of the technologies that are listed here. Sorry for the timing. It works. So sorry. One last time, I promise. <laughs> OK. Uh, because it's showing something else here. Uh, as you can see, most of you can relate to few tools that are laid out here. Uh, some things are very obvious, like Jenkins will get you started, but then when you think about scalability, it, it becomes scary. Uh, Cron and File Watchers, are, it's free and like developers' favorite, but then when you start dealing with complex interdependencies, uh, it tends to become a nightmare. There's a couple of interesting names out there, like Apache Airflow, uh, I heard AWS has an offering for scheduling that they are offering recently. Uh, but then, uh, as an engineering team, we didn't really want to invest any time on experimenting on any of the tools which are in incubation stage. We were looking for something that was like time proven. Also, uh, the big thing that we're looking at was who actually had you know, focus and thought leadership on big data. And when that happened, a lot of things, you know, slowly but surely started fading off. And that's how we decided to go with POC for Control M. I started reading more about it, uh, got my hands on, and the start, I must confess, wasn't like really great of what I was like expecting. I'll just take a minute and explain to you guys like what are my first set of emotions that I went through on day one. It was GUI only. And I'm not a GUI guy. I didn't really like GUI much. And it worked only on Windows. For someone who has been working on Mac all his life, that was driving me crazy. And of course, there's this apprehension of unknown because none of us had tried or tested this. And also, my biggest fear, I just didn't want it to be another IT tool. Uh, imagine ticketing, approval process, change release windows. I mean, you go into a tailspin and never come out of it. Anyways, I convinced myself and my team, and we deep dive, and we thought we'll go ahead with POC for Control M. So two sprints, about four weeks into POC, it completely changed the way uh, I looked at the product. 
So I'll take you guys through a few of the values that we found in a short four week period of POC. Control M for us was very reliable. At the end of POC, I just went there and talked to my DevOps engineers and the developers on our team and asked them how much time did you actually spend on this tool? And to my surprise, nobody had actually spent any time. So it didn't require any maintenance, it didn't require any curating, it was perfect. It was very reliable. Scalability, uh, when I did a case study for this, I happened to talk to a lot of customers who have been successfully using this tool for more than a decade, uh, some of whom uh, have been running close to 150, 200K jobs, and they're doing it flawlessly. So scalability was never, never a question. Hadoop. Uh, I kept saying before that we wanted something that understood Hadoop natively. The reason I put it up there is because Control M could talk to Yarn, if that happens to be your resource manager, natively. It could aggregate Yarn logs, it can talk to Yarn. When you kill a job, it actually initiates a Yarn command to kill the MapReduce job, and not just the wrapper script. It can understand distributed file system, it can do Hadoop HDFS file watchers, distributed copy, Hadoop streaming, Spark jobs, etc., etc. I put learning curve as a value, uh, primarily because we didn't want engineers spending like weeks and weeks trying to get comfortable with the tool just for workload automation. Uh, it was very easy for us. It took us a day or two to hit the ground running and about a week to get comfortable with it. Uh, support, again, I put it there uh, just to let you guys know that this is one tool who stand out when it comes to support. Every time we had a check-in call or an architectural review call, we were put in touch directly with the big data engineers from that team, and it was a very pleasing experience. These are a few of the values that were kind of need to have for us. Apart from this, we got a lot of things out of the box uh, from Control M. Uh, really great uh, tools, I would say. Uh, I would like to highlight three such values today. First up is batch impact analysis. This is a pretty, uh, pretty badass tool. Uh, what it does is it smartly predicts when your workflow or a service would complete. It takes into consideration all your historical statistics, weekly, monthly, volume workloads, uh, is aware of all your global parameters, etc. and we loved it. There's something called self-service. As the name goes, self-service is a capability for all those non-techy analysts to go look at a workflow and then restart or place a file and rerun a job, monitor it, and be aware of what's happening to SLAs. As an engineer, I don't want to waste even a single minute of my day trying to you know, answer somebody of all these like operational questions. When is this completing? What's happening, etc. We like that too. And these days, they're working on something called as an automation API, and we loved it. The reason I say we loved automation API is because it gives you the CLI capabilities for all those non-GUI guys, if you're into it. Uh, it gives you an API capabilities. Basically, your jobs become code. So once your job is a code, you can play around with it. You can embed it with the part of other code, etc. It makes working on Mac, Unix, and other platforms very easy. Uh, eases your continuous integration, GitHub, Jenkins, or whatever you use. I, word the, I use the word eases only because it was capable of doing this even before that. And it gives a great feature parity uh, with the GUI that they have. A lot of jibber jabber. Let's actually dive in and see what it takes to build a control M job using the automation API. It's a simple human readable JSON definition that you use that you can use to define a job. On the left box, if you can see it okay, uh, you just define the categories of the job, like what application, what sub application, where do you want to run it, what is the actual schedule, how do you want to deal with it if it fails or if it underruns, overruns, etc. And on the right side, you can define what each of the tasks does. Like, you know, the first command job happens to be just an echo job. The next job here, in the example, calls a script and does something. And then you can define the actual flow of the job or the workflow. Running is, again, straightforward. You just call the API with the command and point it to the JSON file you just made. It gives you back a run ID and a status URI. 
Using that run ID, you can manage and monitor the status of the workflow. Now, uh, you must be wondering what's that status URI. For all those of you who love to work on GUI and who love colors and like to see things visually, uh, this product has a wonderful, wonderful GUI which is completely, uh, I think I'm, I was really impressed with that. It gives you a full feature parity too. It looks something like this. You can see the workflows, you can see the color coded status of what's happening with each jobs. You can group them with an application or you can have your own custom grouping, etc. Honestly, uh, as an engineer, I don't spend any time on this tool on my day-to-day -day basis. It's so wonderful that you, it's, it's kind of a tool that you set and forget type of a thing. So now looking back on why we chose to invest in something like this, I think it has paid off really well because I didn't want to invest any time in doing this operational task. It has given me a lot of time to focus on dealing with actual problems like how do you handle offsets in Kafka efficiently? Uh, how do you fine tune your ephemeral clusters? Or like what are the best combination of spot versus on-demand nodes for a heterogeneous cluster? Or when my manager pressurizes me to start thinking about serverless architecture, I have more time for this. Uh, that's all I had to say, folks. Thank you. Any questions? Go yes, uh, the question is, uh, is it only a Windows thing? It is only a Windows thing. Uh, the, uh, I wish I could show that, but then I don't have the connectivity. But then all that you can do with Windows can also be done using an automation API. Like it gives you a full feature parity. You can build the jobs, you can run it, manage it, monitor it. It, it almost has a full feature parity. A, a lot of things that runs on Windows is also exposed uh, using a web server that you can uh, access through you know, Mac and other platforms. I'm inclined more towards adopting automation API because that seems to be really exciting. It gives you the flexibility to start you know, playing with the code. Like when you talk about federation layer, eventing framework, you really want to talk to this like scheduling engine in terms of code. So I'm inclined more towards uh, automation API, uh, but I do love uh, the GUI part, having spent three years with this. What is that? Beyond, oh, no. it, it, it has both. Uh, the question is, does it only connect to like uh, and cluster, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, because I was talking about it, talking to Yarn natively. It supports both agent-based and agent-less architecture. So all you need to do is basically install an agent of control M uh, on any component of your ecosystem. And then it can talk back and forth with the server. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.